Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to see Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And when they saw it, told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Wonderful portion of the word of God. But it contains within it the most dreadful request possibly that ever fell from the lips of any mortals. What was this dreadful request that was offered up? Well, you find it in verse 17. And there you find the people's request. They're speaking to Jesus, and it says, they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Dreadful thing whenever somebody comes and says to Jesus, go away, we don't want you here. And yet, in effect, that's what so many people do in this land. They do not want Jesus. You see that made clear even as this season of the year where we hear much about putting Christ into Christmas. Listen, let's get real. The people don't want Christ in Christmas. They want somebody that is sort of mythical or an imagination that they can sort of be sentimental about, but they do not want the Christ of the Bible. And so many people say still to this day to Jesus, go away, we do not want you. Now that's the people's request, but what was the reason for it? Why did they make this request? Well, you see, there's a wonderful work that Jesus had done. And you notice the change that the Lord Jesus had made in this man that he had countered here in the land of the Gadarenes. As you consider this man, you think about where it was that he lived. And it's emphasized again and again in this passage that he lived in the tombs. He lived in among the dead. It wasn't a burial ground like we have down the road or at the back of our own building where people were buried in the ground. It was an array of caves in the hillside. And there he would go into the caves among the dead people and that was his home. That's where he lived. What a state must a person be in to live among the dead. But there's something more with regard to this. Whenever you read in Numbers 19 verse 16, it tells us there that God said that somebody who came in touch with a dead body or who went into a tomb. They were classed as being ceremonially unclean. That is, they were not able to enter into the tabernacle, the place where God was to be worshipped. In later days, they were not able to come into the temple where God was to be worshipped. They were shut out of the worship of God and shut off from God. But this man didn't care. Didn't worry about that. This was his home in among the tombs, in among the dead. What a dreadful state to be in. But that's where so many people are spiritually today. They're among the dead because the Bible tells us that as long as you're outside of Christ and unsaved, you are indeed dead in trespasses and sin and you live among the rest of the spiritually dead. And here is this man. He was among the dead. But although that was the case, notice what this man knew. Whenever Jesus came, he knew exactly who Jesus was. 
And he cries with a loud voice, verse 7, and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? And here is this man in a dreadful, dreadful condition, in every shape and form. And yet he has such a knowledge of who Jesus is. But that knowledge of who Jesus is does him absolutely no good in the state that he is in. And again, how like so many people in our land, if you were to ask them who is Jesus, they'd be able to tell you that he's the Son of God. They would be able to tell you that he is the Holy One. They would be able to tell you he is the Good One. They know so much about him, but it does him not one scintilla of good in the state and condition that they are in. But this man also noticed what he said because he comes running, falls down on his knees before Jesus in an attitude of reverence even, recognizing who he is. But he says to him, I adjure, I adjure you, I plead with you, I beg with you that you don't torment me. What an astonishing thing this was. This man was in a dreadful dreadful condition and you think of the state that he is in and how he lives his life it is utterly utterly dreadful and Jesus has come to be the great liberator to set him free and to give him a whole new life and yet he pleads with Jesus don't come and torment me you see the devil was in control of this man and this man believed the devil's lie and the devil had said to them, See that man, Jesus? He has come to spoil your life. He has come to ruin things for you. He's come to take away your happiness and your pleasure. What utter nonsense. But you know, there are people and they still believe the devil's lie. My, there they are in their sin. And if they could only see and realize the misery that it brings to them in the present, and also the joy it robs of them of in the present. And if they could but see what it will bring to them in the future and the eternal bliss that it snatches out of their hands. But yet, yet they think somehow that Jesus has come to destroy them, come to spoil their life, come to rob them of happiness. I have had people say to me, I'm going to enjoy myself for a while and then I'll get saved. What is the implication of that? That whenever they get saved, they'll not enjoy themselves anymore. I tell you, you will not begin to truly enjoy yourself and know the meaning of deep, real, inner spiritual joy until you are saved. Until you know the Lord. Yes, there may be tears, there may be sorrows at times, may be anguish, but in the midst of it all, you know that Jesus is with you when you're saved. And there's a joy in that. But listen, I want you to notice what this man received. This man who was in such a state, who said, Jesus, leave me alone. I don't want you to torment me. But Jesus ducks away, breaks down all the barriers, and does something wonderful for him. And what does this man receive? Well, you find what he receives in verse 15. Because the people came out from the town and they saw this man as they hadn't seen him before. And they find him at the feet of Jesus, sitting, clothed, in his right mind. In short, he received three things from Jesus. He received tranquility. He received dignity. He also received real sanity. You see, this man did not know peace at all. There he was, living among the tombs. And he would go into these mad rages and he would lift the granite stones and start to gouge lumps out of his flesh and cut him. We hear about self-harming nowadays. Here is self-harming writ large. And whatever the devil really, really was rotting, working upon him, my, that man engaged in these acts of self-attempted destruction. And people would have come in their kindness and pinned him down. Can you see it in your mind's eye? A group of men coming from the town with chains in their hands, trying to do this man a bit of good. And they'll chain him up for his own good. But he'll just break the chains as if they're thread. And he'll go back to that mad career again. 
But here, time is found at peace. Tranquility comes. And oh, peace is such a rare commodity in these days. But Jesus is the great peace giver. And he gave this man wonderful peace. And all who come to him, he grants to them true peace. But he gave this man dignity. Doesn't tell us here in Mark's account. But if you were to look in Luke's account, and in Luke chapter 8, he tells us this, that this man was among the tombs and he wore no clothes. He ran about utterly stark naked. He had lost all sense of dignity. My, you look around you in these days and you see the people and have lost all sense of dignity. It seems to be that they want to be able to go about with as few clothes on them as they possibly can. I remember one night driving down in the Cookstown. It was the middle of winter and there was a nightclub there in Cookstown and they were queued out. It was half 11 at night. I was coming home from preaching in a meeting and they were queued down the street and the rain was falling. It would have foundered you. And there were young girls and they were standing there. And I tell you, I used to wear more going into the sea to swim than they were wearing. Well, that's an exaggeration, but it wasn't far off it. And I tell you this, people have lost their dignity. And there's no shame anymore. And this man had lost his dignity completely. He didn't care what people thought about him anymore. Ever seen somebody like that? And they get to that stage in their sin and they lost all of their dignity, but Jesus gave them back his dignity. He's clothed. He's sitting and he's clothed. For the first time in years, this man has a bit of dignity back to him again. But then the third thing that he received was his sanity. He's in his right mind. He's in his right mind. You know, people think that whenever you come to trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior, somehow or other you've gone off your head. I remember being in Five Mile Town, round Spite Road, round the estate one day, and I was standing talking to some people in their garden, and another man was leaning over the fence, and they joined in the conversation, and they were as nice as ninepence, as pleasant as could be, and took the tracts and all the rest. Oh, that was nice of you to call. And I walked away and it was a few steps up and I turned over my shoulder and I caught the man on going to the friends like that, tapping his, the side of his head. He's mad. He's mad. Listen, Christians aren't mad. They're the ones to whom God has given real sanity to recognize the state and the condition that they're in and come to Jesus and be made right, and to be able to sit at peace with dignity, to be able to think as you ought to think about the things that need your attention. This is the wonderful change that our Lord brought about, the change that he made. But another thing that Jesus did, the safety that he provided, not just for this man, but for the common populace, Whenever you read Matthew chapter 8, his account of this tells us that this individual had a companion with him. We don't read about him in Mark or Luke, but in Matthew we do. And it tells us in Matthew that both of these men were exceeding fears so that people feared to go that way. My, this man in his rage, whenever he would see somebody coming into the vicinity who had come down, marauding down, and nobody was safe with them. Women and children dare not go near them. Men even wouldn't walk that way on their own. They would be gripped with fear. They always needed companions. And here is a place that was been characterized by such unsafety because of this man's sinful behavior. And now it's made safe. And still in spite of that, what the Lord has done they say to Jesus, no, no, go away. We don't want you. We will not have you. But then there's certainly the disturbance that Christ created. And he did create a disturbance. Because whenever the people who were in the vicinity saw what had happened, they run into the nearby town. And the whole town comes out to see what is going on. He disturbed the whole town. And the whole town is turned upside down because of our Lord Jesus and what he has done. 
Now, whenever the Lord really begins to work, he can turn a place upside down. Remember, it tells us in the book of Acts that the people complained about the apostles, what they're preaching, and they said, these men have turned the whole world upside down. You know, it can create a commotion. Days aren't always like this, where you've only got the interested few, comparatively speaking, who come along and sit tranquilly to hear the word of God. Whenever God is really moving, when Christ is really working, I tell you, it causes a commotion. Oh, that we had a commotion. We need a commotion in these days. I say this often. In the book of Acts, two things went hand in hand. Revival and riots. You know, whenever the Lord really moves, he stirs people up and it can cause a commotion. And then I want you to notice this. There is also the industry that he destroyed. Because here are these people and they had an industry going. They were keeping pigs. Now, they should not have been doing that because God has told the Jewish people that for them the pigs were unclean, but they they had their hands in an unclean business. Now, nothing wrong with people raising pigs around for manna. Uh, That law doesn't be binding in us, but for them it was. And Jesus came and he utterly destroyed their unclean industry. 2,000 pigs down the hill and into the lake, and every one of them drowned. And, you know, the people were raging. You know, there are times whenever Christ begins to work and he destroys industries. Back in this province, indeed across the world in 1859, there was a mighty revival. And in this province, you read the history books, and those places where the distilleries were, where they made the alcohol, you know what? They were closed down because their sales diminished. There were many pubs in this land that had to close. And there were men who were publicans owned their pubs and they were saved. They took the drink out and poured it down the street. They wouldn't even sell it for somebody else to sell. And whenever God moves, it might be the drinking industry that'll get hit. And glory to God if it was. I remember my mother telling me of how whenever she was a a young girl and she was in a lady's home with my mother's own mother, my grandmother. And as they were sitting there, the door opened and a mutual friend came in, a lady whose husband owned a pub and this woman was distraught and she was in tears and she was really, really annoyed. And so they said to her, what's wrong with you? And she said, I was away here in Willie Nick preaching. W.P. Nicholson, they called him Willie Nick. And she said, whenever he was preaching, he said, the publicans are nothing but demon bloodsuckers. And she was so annoyed that he would say such a thing about her husband. Oh, listen. Listen. It will be a great day for this province when Christ works and closes the pubs. I wish he would do it. But listen, he could add the drugs as well. And see all of the gambling. My, this country is awash with gambling. You can't get away from it. They'll gamble on virtually anything. And the money they spent on lottery cards is immense. And it's an epidemic that is drawing homes and lives. But you know, whenever the Lord begins to work, he could even demolish that industry. And so you see here is this people's request. And this is the reason for it. What Christ has done. Now listen, listen to their calculation with regard to it. They made a calculation with regard to what Jesus had done. And it tells us this. Listen carefully. It says, verse 15, that they came and saw the man clothed, sitting in his right mind. They were afraid. And they that saw it told him how it befell him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the pigs. And they began to pray him to pray Jesus to depart out of their coasts. They made a calculation. Here is Jesus 
who can give back this man his tranquility, his dignity, his sanity, his whole salvation. But this Jesus, in doing so, can destroy our industry. And they made the calculation. Listen, they calculated pigs were more important than souls. Isn't that a dreadful thing to do? And it's not the sort of thing that still goes on. Oh, what people class as being more important than souls. More important than, than the eternal welfare of an ever-dying precious soul. Far better to see a soul go to hell and us keep our illicit businesses in our sin. That's how little they thought of it. And oh, is it not so in these days? How little value is put upon a soul, a precious, precious soul. Our Lord Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? You think of the immense value that there is in this car park today. Every person in this car, car park their soul is worth more than all the riches in this world amalgamated and put together. And Christ, he came and he gave the only thing in this world that is more valuable than a soul. He gave his own precious blood that souls might be saved. And when he went to Calvary, he shed his blood even for this man that we're reading about now. He was able to deal with this man and change him in forgiveness and forgive him in light of what he was going to do for him when he would go to the cross. Now he can change people, forgive them, transform their lives because of what he has done for them on the cross. But these people, the soul mattered so little to them. There's a lesson we draw now from this, this request that was made. I want you to think about this. Who was the worst in this scenario? The man who had been possessed with the demons, running about naked, cut him himself with stones, living among the graves? Are these people who have been living in the town, living in luxury perhaps, with plenty, looked up to by their neighbors because they were prosperous? Who were the worst? I tell you this, I believe that those people who came and said to Jesus, no, we don't want you, leave our shores, were worse than that demoniac. You know, there are people walking about our province, there are people walking about this county in these days, and they're so prosperous, and they look so good in the externals, and they will look down their noses at some of the people that they would see rolling about in the streets. And in reality, if you could see into their hearts, they're at least every bit as bad, if not worse. Oh, that we could see things as they truly, truly are. Here is the people's request. Very quickly, the Savior's response. What did the Savior do in response to this request? You know what he did? He got into the boat and he sailed away again. He went back to where he came from. Be careful, be careful about saying to Jesus, I don't want you to go away. Think what a dreadful thing if it were, it would be if he were to go away and leave you. How sad, how tragic. Oh, be careful about turning your back on the Savior. Be careful about rejecting him and saying, I do not want you. But yet, that said, our Savior is such a gracious and merciful Savior. And I want you to see now the man's responsibility. This man, who had indeed been so dramatically transformed by the gracious Savior, now that he is indeed a transformed man, there's a responsibility laid on his shoulders. He wants to go and become part of Jesus' entourage and be with him and follow him around the country and listen to him preaching, watching him doing the miracles. He's well-meaning. He wants to be with the Lord. But the Lord says to him, no. No, I will not allow you to go, come with me. But he says you're to go home to your friends. Go back to those that you once knew, your family, your friends, 
those who know you well. And this man's responsibility, as soon as the Lord transforms him, is this, it is to obey the Savior. Oh, that we would learn this whenever we are saved. As soon as we are saved, from that instant, this is our responsibility to say to the Savior, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, I know what I would like to do. But that's not what counts. It's what you want me to do, Lord. And show me what you want me to do. And oh, you just be obedient to him. And you follow him. I wonder, am I speaking to a disobedient Christian here today? You can be saved. And go on in life and then you can become disobedient. Remember Jonah the prophet in the Old Testament? If you're a disobedient Christian, it's a time you got back onto the path of obedience. You'll not know real blessing. You'll rob yourself of your joy. You'll deprive yourself of your peace. Get back onto the pathway of obedience. Follow him wherever he might lead you. Maybe there's somebody here and he has been exercising you to obey him. And the first thing that he wants every truly born again Christian to do, and that is to be baptized publicly in profession of your faith in him. That's the command he gives to all. You're to be baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. Not necessary for salvation, but it's necessary for obedience. You should obey the Savior when he tells you. But this man, his first responsibility was to obey. And his next responsibility is to testify. He says to him, go home and tell thy friends the great things the Lord hath done for thee. And he does go home. And he's to testify as to be verbal. He's to tell them what the Lord has done for him. You're not to keep it to yourself when the Savior saves you. You're to go and tell people the great things the Lord has done for you. Doesn't mean you have to stand on a platform like this. Doesn't mean you have to go into a public meeting. Indeed, whenever you read the Acts of the Apostles, you don't see any such thing as testimony meetings and people getting up on a platform and standing before a crowd and giving a testimony. Not even the Apostle Paul or Peter and Alma did that. But everybody is expected to witness and testify. Let people know, whenever you meet them, when you get the opportunity, that you belong to Jesus. He saved you, and he has changed your life. And it is to be visual a verbal, and it's to be visible. It is to be clear what has happened to you. You see, the people looked, and they saw this man, and they could see that he's a change. He's a different man. One of the greatest preachers that has ever lived outside the Bible was a Welsh man called Christmas Evans. He lived in the 19th century, and he was a remarkable preacher. And he could paint wonderful word pictures. He has a tremendous sermon in this very account. Pictures this man going home to his friends. And he's walking down into the town. And the word goes round. The madman from among the tombs is coming. And the people come running out saying what he's going to do. What sort of violence is going to erupt. But they stand open mouthed. They cannot believe that this is the same man. And then Evans pictures that among the people, there's one of uh, the, the man's children. And so the child sees him and he runs home and he says, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy's coming. And she says, Oh no, what will he do? Lock the door, barricade it, keep him out. Maybe he'll beat us. And he says, But no, he's coming differently. Now usually whenever he came, he just came in a straight line tumbling over hedges and ditches, but now he's walking properly the way people should walk. And she looks and she sees. And he says, not only that, he's got clothes on him. And the mother looks and says, it is him. It's true. It's real. It's him. Oh, listen. Listen. Go home and tell your friends What great things the Lord has done for you, but make sure they can see it. Make sure they know it, and make sure it is indeed viable. And this man's testimony was viable, you know. 
because we only have to turn over into chapter 7. And you find that the Lord Jesus returns. He returns to this place, the Capolis, that had driven him out, and he gets a different reception. And he works wonderful things. And he does glorious things among them. And you see, this man, he became Christ's missionary in the Capolis. See it, Spurgeon, that wonderful preacher. He preached from this very story, and he used this title, Christ's Curate in the Capolis. And Christ sent that man home to prepare the way. You know, whenever you're saved, you can go home to your friends, your friends that don't want Jesus, the friends that say, keep him away from me. But your friends can be used as an inroad for Jesus. My own wife had no time for the things of God, no interest in the Bible or salvation, just didn't want the living over there in Glasgow, attaining to the life that she had looked forward to for so many years, working as a nurse and, and as I said before, working part-time as a barmaid to uh, supplement her income. And her friend, May, got saved. And when she told Christine, Christine said, that's all very well for you, May, but you keep it to yourself. I don't want it. But it was a chink in the armor. And God worked. And eventually Christine was brought to the Savior. Ah, go home and tell your friends what great things the Lord has done for you. Are you saved tonight? The wish you were able to shout it out loud enough so that I could hear you to say yes. Well, if you're saved, let everybody know about it. But listen, if you're not going to make it visible and clear that it's genuine, keep your mouth shut. Better no witness than a witness like that. Make sure it's a genuine thing. And if you're listening to me tonight, and up to this point in your life you've been saying no to Jesus, saying to him that you don't want him, oh, may the Lord melt your heart and bring you to him and save him, save you and change your life and enable you to tell others what great things the Lord has done for you. May God bless his word. We're going to sing together and then I'll pray this lovely, lovely hymn. Jesus, the sinner's friend to thee, lost and undone for aid I flee. Weary of earth, myself in sin, open thine arms and take me in. What a wonderful hymn this is. May you not just sing it, but may you pray it and come to the Lord Jesus. Jesus, the sinner's friend. <clears throat>
Oh God, our Father, how we thank you for your presence and your aid this afternoon. We thank you, our God, for these wonderful words that we have been singing. How sweet they are. Lord, I am sin, but thou art love. I give up every plea beside, Lord, I am lost, but thou hast died. We pray, our Father, that there will be some who will make those words their prayer today. They will recognize their lost condition and that they will look to Jesus and cry out to him for cleansing and forgiveness. Oh, receive them, Father. Receive them as your own and change and transform their lives. For those of us who are saved, oh, Lord, help us to be obedient to you and help us to bear testimony to what you have done. Help us to go home and show and tell our friends the great things that you have done for us. Now, our God, we thank you for your aid this day. Keep us safe as we make our way home. Bless those who are already at home, and continue to speak on through the power of your word, we ask in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen and amen. God bless. Thank you again for being with us.